Oh, good morning. I must say that Zena and I are very excited about being back in Wongaray Church after 44 years. A lot of things have happened in those years. People that I've known are not here and people I don't know, many of them are here. I just wish I had more time to get to know you all. It's a very exciting time for us. And this place is so full of memories, I don't know just where to start. And so I better not, because they say when you get old, all you want to do is reminisce. And uh, Grant made the comment about uh, me being old. Uh, when I turned 80, I told my church at home, you're now allowed to call me old. It was years before that when they called me old when I was in the mission field. They used to call me the old fella, and which, which was a, a sign of endearment. It was a compliment. It took me a while to get around to that. But there's not a lot of fun getting old, but you can make the most of it, can't you? When you uh, enjoy the facilities, the hall next door and the Dorcas facilities there, you may like to think that two solid years of hard work went into providing you with those facilities, plus the school. And a lot of people who aren't here today contributed in a very wonderful way to making those facilities possible. Uh, some of you are here. We, Dick Martin is there, of course. He was our, our main carpenter and, and uh, our builder and director of all the labour but we, we depended so much on the church now I see you're having a, a working bee we had working bees every week and sometimes all week so we had a, a mobile mill that was dedicated to us by the McGee brothers for a whole year on the understanding that we had a roster system and we provided them with two men every day of the week which we did and that was the backbone of our building project we not, not only provided all the timber for our building project, but two and a half house lots as well. Because we had to buy the house next door and the house next, in this corner as well. And that was quite a challenge because the people didn't want to leave. So we had to go and have a quiet little chat in their lounge room and say, look, we, we want your house. We want to pull it down and make a hall and here a car park. Oh, they didn't want to leave. So we said, well, what if we find you a nicer house somewhere else in town? Would you leave? Hmm, I said, yeah, maybe. So we got the estate agents busy and we worked it all out and both of those homes became available to us. Because it was a $96,000 project, uh, pounds, wasn't it? A uh, 96,000 pound project. Back in those days, in the 1960s, it was big money. Frightened everyone to death when we put it up on the blackboard. And there was a lot of discussion going backwards and forwards, negative and positive, and this dear old lady, and I've forgotten her name now, she stood up and she said, I'm really convinced that this is what we have to do. And I don't want to hear any more negative comments because she said, I'm going to dedicate my home as the first donation to the building project. I'm going to sell our house and, and land and, and that money will all go to the building project and I'm going to go and live in the granny flat with my son and his wife. Well, now that really caused a stir. Everyone, he, <laughs> they thought, my word, this is going to build into something big. And it did. And uh, the money flowed in, but we, we earned the money. Every Sunday down at Ring Roses, they're cutting down the tea tree. We had a contract with the hospital to provide them with all their firewood for a whole year. And so every Sunday it was Ring Roses. And during the week it was with the McGees. <laughs> Two years of solid work provided you with the facilities that you're enjoying now. And I've, I've been handy with the paintbrush ever since my father tried to turn me into a carpenter and I became a painter instead. So I did all the painting on that hall. I see you've stuck some stuff on the wall now. I don't know what that's all about. 
it looks like some kind of stretched wheat bix, but I don't know, I guess it's got a reason for being there. It's hiding all my paintwork. And every panel we had a different colour. Not too contrasty, just you no know, nice shady yellow into this colour into pink into blues and every panel was a different colour all around. Great memories, great times. And not only did we enjoy our building program here, but we had the privilege of baptising 64 people during our three years in this district. And uh, I had Dargaval Church, I had Kaikoui, I had Openoni. So I really got to know the country and, and they, they were wonderful years. And married people and baptised people and it's great, it was exciting. Well, after that, of course, we went to the South Island. We thought we'd get back to Australia after that, but no, we got called to South Island, and then we got back to Australia for 10 years, and then we went to the mission field for 13 years. Six years in the Solomons, seven years in Vanuatu, and uh, as there we retired, or we were supposed to retire. We had a, a year off, and then uh, we started looking after churches all over the place, Norfolk Island, Lord Howe, Broome, Derby, Waitara Church in Sydney and during those uh, 13 years we've looked after 17 churches uh, still looking after a church our home church on the Tweed River and the president rang me up and said well it looks like you're going to have an extra church next year so two churches next year so we keep saying we've never volunteered we just said to the Lord if you want us we're here and lo and behold the telephone rings and there's a president on the other end, and they don't ring me for advice at my age. So, uh, what's happening? Uh, we've got a church in such and such a place. Last year we were at Ayr and Home Hill up in North Queensland. And that was a, an interesting experience for us. So, the Lord has used us, and it's been a great experience, and we, we have no regrets. And it's just wonderful to be here, because this was my... Second church, Royal Oak was my first because I'd been six years in Sydney look, you know, being song leader and choir master for different evangelists, Jim Cherry and John Coldhart and Austin Cook. I never had a church. We were too busy with evangelism. So I was seven years in the ministry and never had a church and I came over here Royal Oak and I didn't know a thing about being a pastor. They were very patient with me, very merciful and condescending because so I made so many blunders and mistakes and a few more up here as well. But the Lord is gracious and uh, the saints are very patient. And uh, I, I, I just thank the Lord for the wonderful time we had in Wangarei. So thank you for letting me reminisce just a little. And uh, may the Lord bless us as we worship him today. Perhaps we could just invite the Holy Spirit, could we? Father in heaven, we just pray the Holy Spirit will come and touch our hearts and minds as we explore your word, that we will find things here that will challenge us and encourage us in our Christian journey. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So the uh, young ladies, they had the scripture reading, and uh, we're going to explore that from Second Chronicles, if you'd like to. Turn in your iPads, your iPhones, and those old-fashioned ones with their Bibles. <laughs> Sign of old age. All right, we're going to, to Second Chronicles chapter 20. Let's look at verse 1. It happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. And some came and told Jehoshaphat saying a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea from Syria and they are in Hazazon Tamar which is En Gedi. Remember En Gedi, that's where David hid away from Saul. It's a fascinating place. And so we're really looking at the area of the Dead Sea. Verse 3, And Jehoshaphat feared 
and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. You know, it's not a sin to get frightened. It's only a sin if you forget that the Lord is there to support you in whatever fear you might have. And Jehoshaphat had good reason to be frightened. The, this multitude, the, this was made up of three different armies. They combined forces to annihilate Israel. This wasn't going to be just any ordinary battle. This was going to be the end of Israel. They were going to drive them into the Mediterranean Sea and confiscate all their goods and occupy their land. And as Jehoshaphat thought about all this, he, he was really frightened. And so he did the wise thing. And he was a wise king. He did the wise thing. He set himself to seek the Lord. You know, many times we have problems and, and, and we try to solve them in all kinds of different ways. Even, even medical problems. And we, we find out uh, that we've been analysed with this, that and the other thing. And somewhere along the line we think, oh, I, I better pray about this. And the Bible sort of suggests to us very strongly that whatever situation, whatever problem, whatever challenge we face, the first thing is to go to the Lord. Not later on down the track. This often happens with anointing. You know, it kind of troubles me with anointing. Sometimes people are dealing with, with a health issue and they go along, 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 along and then after a while the doctor says, sorry, there's nothing else we can do for you and they think, oh, we better get anointing. That, that really isn't the way to go. We're going to look at that in James. He doesn't suggest that, does he? He said, that's not, anointing isn't the last resort. Going to the Lord is not the last resort. Going to the Lord is the first resort. And Jehoshaphat teaches us this, that le important lesson. So here is the call for all of Judah. Now notice verse 4, the response, would you? So Judah gathered together. This is not one person. Judah's talking about the whole uh, race of, of Israel, the southern nation of Israel. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Now one exciting thing about this that really strikes home to my heart is that this brought about unity. Unity is, the, is as I see it, after 52 years of ministry, unity, as I see it, is the most urgent priority facing the Seventh-day Adventist Church today. And you remember that when uh, Elder Wilson came in as the General Conference President, he hardly had time to, to warm the chair behind that big desk when he was promoting revival and reformation. Remember that? And, and it came down all the various levels and came down to the grassroots, to all the pastors. Preach revival and reformation. It was in our magazines, in the record, in all the other things. People were getting into this idea, we need revival and reformation. You know something? You don't hear any more about that now. You know why? Because suddenly the penny dropped and they realised... You can't have revival and reformation unless you're united. And that's the challenge facing the Seventh-day Adventist Church today. We need to get united. There's no room for pluralism in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We've got to get our act together. And if Johnny's out of step, then talk to Johnny and get him into step. But we have so many Johnnies that's not funny. But here, because these people were facing annihilation, this was their last hope. What did they do? And their first hope, they all came together united as one. This is the, the solid message of this story of Jehoshaphat. Well then, it, we had the scripture reading from verse 5 all the way to verse 12. So we skipped that bit. because so We've already done that because this is Jehoshaphat's prayer. And, and he's uh, copying a lot of what was said by Solomon when they dedicated the temple. So we come in on verse 13 and we follow this unity theme. Notice what it says. Now all Judah, all, everyone, no one missing, 
with their little ones, their wives and their children, stood before the Lord. Wow. What, what, what an exciting scene that is. The whole nation of Judah have all come to stand before the temple. There is their king sitting on his throne or whatever he's sitting on, on the side of the steps. And, and some of the priests and leaders all standing around. And there's a mass of people all there. They're united as one. No, no squabbling about doctrines or argument about this or this style of worship or that style of worship or all this stuff. No. They're all united in seeking the Lord for his blessing and his protection and his care. Well, you know, when, when the church gets that kind of united status, God is going to move. God is going to set things going. And you look at verse 14. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah. And moving down the verse, it says, A Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. Well, now, who's this guy? Jehaziel. Never heard of him until there. And the interesting thing is, you'll never hear of him again. This is one of the young guys standing there in the crowd. No one special. He was a PK, yes, but he was no one real special. He was just one of the mob there. Seeking the Lord like everyone else. And this is what you call the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. And Jesus is going to testify to these people through the spirit of prophecy because it says the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel. And that's a remarkable event that took place because they were all united in seeking the Lord. All right, now what, what is he going to do with this? Look at, his, uh, look at verse 15. And he said, Listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord to you. All right, so this is his introduction. <laughs> people are probably saying who's this guy what, 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 what a cheek he's got to stand up on the steps there and, and, and talk to the king like that and everybody who authorised him to do that no, no one's worrying about it because they're all so scared stiff and they're facing annihilation to the point where they're willing to listen to anybody that's got a message and they listened very carefully and this is his message and it's for us this morning he says Listen, do not be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude. Underline these words, for the battle is not yours but God's. My friends, we have made tremendous progress in our Christian journey when we've learnt that lesson. The battle is not yours but God's. How many battles have you tried to sort out on your own. Domestic battles, financial battles, work battles, family battles, teenage battles, <laughs> all the kind of battles that we have. And we didn't seek the Lord first. We tried to sort them out ourselves. In most cases, made a mess of things. This is one of the messages for you to take home today. If, you, if you've learnt nothing from this sermon, please take this message home today. The battle is not yours, but God's. All right, now he's got some more remarkable things to say here. Verse 16, he says, Tomorrow, go down against them. This is radical stuff. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. And notice, you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord is with you. And this is remarkable stuff. Here's this young fellow, Jehaziel, 
claiming to have a message from God and no one's arguing about it. And he says, you're not going to run away and hide in the caves or in the bush. You're going to go out and face the enemy, but you don't need to take any swords or spears or shields. Leave that all at home. Just go out there and face the enemy and see what God can do. Now, that's just very radical, isn't it? Approaching a, a multitude of enemies like this, huge armies all combined with your annihilation and you're being told by some apparently ordinary, unauthorised person to go and do something radical like that. Now, the scripture tells us to do a lot of radical things, really. And Jesus, when he was here, he, he taught a lot of radical things, didn't he? he? He taught us to love our enemies. Those people have never heard such nonsense. Love your enemies? No, no, no. Love your friends, love your family, love your, your associates, but love your enemies? Oh, come on. And when you go through the Sermon on the Mount... There's radical things all the way through it. Incredible. Now judge not that you be not judged. All these kind of amazing things there. Radical. And here's this young man. He's presenting a radical message from God. Do something that had never ever been done before. Well, how are they going to respond to that? Well, look at verse 18. The, the message is over. Uh, Jehaziel's moment of glory is finished. He, he drops out of the scene. You never hear of him again. It's all over for him. Now Jehoshaphat takes over. And look at verse 18. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord and worshipped the Lord. And, and the thing that strikes me is that there's no dissenting word here. Everyone has accepted this young man's message that it, it was the testimony of Jesus appearing in the spirit of prophecy. It's radical, but let's do it. You know, I, when, I, when I read this verse and I think about our situation as a Seventh-day Adventist church, we have a lot of radical things to share with the world around us. You know, we, we want to worship on the seventh day instead of the first. That's radical in the thinking of the world out there. In fact, so radical, I think it's queer and weird and, and out of step with, with culture and, and the thinking of the world. We, we have a health message. That's radical. When... when Ellen White received her vision on health. Th those people, w even in the, in the church, they were, they were smoking and, and uh, eating pork and, and doing all kinds of weird and wonderful things. And they were sick. You know, they had three leaders that they'd chosen back there. They voted three men. And those three men were to meet on a regular basis to plan and org the organise of, of the early growing church and they had a trouble getting together because there was always one of them or two of them that was sick there was a time of sickness back there that's why they built the, the big sanitarium because they, they, they were trying to cater for all the sickness of that age that time we're back there again we're living in a, in a world of sickness aren't we not? I guarantee there's not one person in this church today that hasn't got some kind of physical problem or ailment. We're living in an age of sickness. When, when, when God called the children of Israel out of Egypt, they had all kinds of sicknesses. Because you remember, he said, you follow my leading and my guidance, my instruction, you won't have the diseases of, his, of the Egyptians, which they obviously had had. He said, follow my instructions. And he, and he put them on a diet, a new lifestyle. And they complained and whinged and carried on. But if they'd have followed that, they would have become the super race that God intended they should have become. And when God gave Ellen White those visions on health reform, it was God's intention that we would become a super race 
in our society today. And it's all very well for the Reader's Digest to say, yes, from, from our studies of, of, of heart disease, that the Seventh-day Adventists on average live from eight to ten years longer than anyone else. Should be a whole lot more than that. That's nothing to get excited about. People should be, should be flocking to our hospitals and our doctors and, and, and our health directors and so on to get instructions on how to live healthy lives. But here we are, we've, we've progressed all this period of time. We're still mucking around with dairy foods and all these things that are causing diabetes and heart disease and all these sicknesses. Adventists are getting the same diseases that people out there are getting. Shouldn't be like that. Because we have a radical message. We are a radical church. We are unique. Well, let's see what else we can learn from our story here. Verse 19, Then the Levites and the children of the Kohathites, uh, of the children of the Kohathites, stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. Praising God. You see, this is the step to take. When, once you've got a problem, you come to the Lord, ask him to help you solve the problem, and the problem is solved, then you come to the Lord and thank him for his intervention. So it's the way to go. So, did they take action on the instructions? Well, of course they did. Verse 20. So they rose early in the morning. So they went to bed that night and slept a good sound sleep, came back early in the morning, and they went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. And this is the second one you've got to mark in your Bibles. Believe the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. My friends, applying that into your lives is another boost to your Christian journey. Two principles. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. How do we get to believe in God? From reading this book. This is where we get all our belief system from. From the teachings that we have. From the prophets. And from Jesus. And all the other great men of scripture. This is where it all happens. We establish our faith through God's word. And then we believe his prophets. Well, all these prophets, of course, they're all important. And Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and all going right through. But we have a very great privilege to be in possession of a prophet. Now, this, this is something that kind of troubles me a little bit. Uh, when, when we talk about Ellen White and her influence on the church, there are always some people who roll their eyes or look at the ceiling or look at their boots for some reason. There are some of us who are ashamed of Ellen White. I suppose because people have made fun of her for some reason or other. But I want to tell you this morning, my friend, we have got no reason to be ashamed of Ellen White or the Spirit of Prophecy or her books. 44 books, thousands of manuscripts and articles, all pointing us to Jesus. Nothing wild and, and radical in that. We have every reason to be very proud of our heritage. And every reason to be very proud of Ellen White and her teachings and her books. Take an example, for instance. And we've got our Mormon friends. And uh, they're, not, they're not ashamed of, of uh, Joseph Smith. Quite proud of him. But have you ever read his history? You know? You wouldn't want him to live next door and he'd pinch your wife on you. He, 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 was a, a, he was a rotter, a rascal, a villain, and a liar. This Book of Mormon that he got, this manuscript with all his gold plate nonsense, he pinched it out of a printer's shop. It was written by a Presbyterian minister as a novel. He saw it there and he pinched that 
and he came up with all this wild and wonderful story and people believed it because people believe anything run these days it seems and before they used to believe anything but but are the mormons are they, are they ashamed of no quite proud of that well what what, what about our, our muslims friends are, are they ashamed of muhammad no every second boy's called muhammad they're proud of him but have you read his history he, he makes Ned Kelly look like a Sunday school teacher. He was a highway robber, a murderer. He went into a city and, and he slaughtered thousands of Jews, men, women and children, because he didn't like them. He, he, he was a paedophile. He was a bigamist. I don't know what else you can say about him. <laughs> but the Muslims are proud of him. And yet here we are, Seventh-day Adventists, and we've got Ellen White with her wonderful writings upholding Jesus and pointing us to the right road to follow and how to live healthy, happy, spiritual lives. And we kind of don't want to really talk too much about Ellen White. You know, not a few weeks back I preached a sermon. I, I usually quote Ellen White occasionally, you know, here and there in my sermons and I preached in this church and I, I had three quotes not, not big ones but three quotes of Ellen White and some of the folks complained said you know, we don't want to hear all this uh, quoting Ellen White we want to hear the Bible oh I felt like going home and crying and then praying for them praying for their conversion but I don't know about you over here, but over there we don't hear very many preachers quoting Ellen White. I hope and pray that that's not the situation in New Zealand. But that's what we've got over there. We can be proud of her. What did King Jehoshaphat say? Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you will prosper. If you want the Wangarei Church to prosper... Uphold the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy and follow it. Because they're there not just to look at, not just nice books on the shelf. They're there for us. All right, must move on. The enemy on the wall up there is making me feel uncomfortable. All right, so what happens next? When, verse 21, and when they had consulted with the people, or when he... Jehoshaphat had consulted with the people he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying all right so now they're getting organized and the singers are going first fancy putting the choir in the front and the army at the back but this is the way it went and they're praising God they say that when you're scared when you're nervous when you're upset when you're stressed sing and it's, it's therapeutic. And that's why we come to church and we sing. It helps to move away all the stress and problems we've had during the week because singing does something for your whole physical body. It gets the blood moving. It gets your brain alert. And, and you, you, you feel that something good is happening in your life. Singing. Praising. And they, they praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Maybe we've got time to do this. If you would just leave a marker there, we'll go over to Psalm 136, and this is where their song is. Psalm 136. This is not really a hymn. It's more like a chant, like you'd get in a monastery today. It's a sort of a chant that they used to have. And I'll read the, the first bit, and you'll follow up with for his mercy endures forever. We'll just do a few verses just to get the atmosphere of what it was like as they marched out to meet the enemy. Well, if you're all ready, Psalm 136, I will give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Good. I will give thanks to the God of gods. I will give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone does great wonders. 
to him who by wisdom made the heavens, to him who laid out the earth above the waters, to him who made great lights, the sun to rule by day, the moon and stars to rule by night. Yes, that's what they sang as they went out, reminding them that they serve a creator God, a wonderful God. And they sang this as they marched out, the choir giving the lead, just like you have your, your musicians up here giving us the lead in our singing. The choir gave the lead, the Kohathites, and everybody sang. And what a, what a wonderful uh, volume of music that would be. And, and what did it do? Look at verse 22. When they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab and Mount Seir who had come against Judah and they were defeated. Oh, I love this verse because you come to church full of stress and problems and you start singing, what happens? <coughs> dissipates. It dissipates because you're enjoying the atmosphere and the experience of music and God removes all the enemies out of your soul and your heart so verse <clears throat> verse 23 for the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them and when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir they helped to destroy one another they went crazy this wasn't in the dark with confusion, this was in the daylight when they were all there with their weapons ready to march onto Israel. But God affected their brain. They became confused. And they didn't know who their enemy or who their friend was. And so they got into and fought each other in panic. But this, the, the inference here is that when they heard the singing, as Judah approached the lookout they heard that singing that so disturbed them because they weren't in the habit of, of that kind of activity they were probably more used to a rock and roll type of music with stamping your feet and jumping all around but this beautiful melodious song coming out in the volume it affected their head they went crazy and they slaughtered each other till the last man fell on the sword. And there it all was. Amazing. Verse 24. So when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were their dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. What an amazing scene. Verse 25. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil... They found among them an abundance of valuables to the dead, on the dead bodies and precious jewellery which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days gathering the spoil because there was so much. That gives you an idea how big this multitude was. And you think that all those hundreds of thousands of troops, what about their backup? You see, they would have had to bring herds of cattle and sheep to provide them with food. They would have had all, all their ox carts lo loaded with, with flour and, and, and utensils and their cooking people and, and, and all the backup that comes with an army. Huge number of people and all that stuff. And they would have had empty ox carts too because they were going to carry home all the souvenirs they expected to take out of Israel when they destroyed Judah. So they had empty carts ready to put all the goodies in all the loot so all that stuff was there and, and so when, when the people of Judah decided to, to uh, confiscate the, the camels and the horses and, and the, the donkeys and the mules and the, and the ox and the cattle and the sheep whew, so whatever financial status those people from Judah were when they came into that scene they would have gone home very wealthy 
And the object lesson there, isn't it? That when we have problems and challenges and difficulties, we come to the Lord and, and realize that the battle is not ours but his and let him take over. We're going to end up so much better off by letting him work it all out. And this is a wonderful story. And the spiritual lessons are here. I, I just don't have time to deal with them all. There's so many in this story. All right, well, what happened? They, they were three days taking home the loot. And then let's look, let's conclude our, our sermon with, with these last few words here. And verse 26, And on the fourth day they assembled in the valley of Baraka, for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore the name of the place was called the Valley of Baraka to this day. So they had a worship service. Then they returned, every man of Judah and Jerusalem, from Jehoshaphat in, with Jehoshaphat in front of them, to go back to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. So they came to Jerusalem with stringed instruments and harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. Then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest all around. And that's what happens when you put all your troubles in God's hands and let him work it all out, you end up with peace and rest because he's handled it all his best way. And you don't have the stress of trying to sort out your problems your way, which mostly don't work. So my friends, here is a wonderful story of the gospel and experience of this wonderful King Jehoshaphat. And I hope and pray that the lessons here will, will remain in your thoughts and that this church will aim for unity. If, if anyone in this church is a bit out of step theologically or some other way, go to your pastor, get yourself sorted out. Don't just make a big issue of it and try and get everybody to think the way you think. That's only going to make a bad situation worse. Get into tune. Get into line. As I said before, there's no room for pluralism in the Seventh Adventist Church if we want to be united. Get united, then we'll have revival and reformation. And then the Holy Spirit can get busy and we'll find that we'll be well on our way to God's kingdom. God bless you, each one.
Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a God that we can trust. We thank you for the way Jesus led and directed in the affairs of Judah and how he preserved them, protected them from annihilation. We thank you for the great king, Jehoshaphat, that he was willing to listen to the spirit of prophecy and follow its directions. We thank you for the young man who was selected, no doubt because he was a godly young man. And how important it is if we can be in that state of spirituality so that you can speak through us whenever you want to. We just thank you for the messages of this wonderful story. And may we realise that the battle is yours, not ours. That you are willing to fight on our behalf. So please, may the thoughts that we've shared today permeate our thinking as we move into another week. Influence our lives in your favour, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.